everybody and welcome to this episode of Mind the Gap with me, Emma Turner and Tom Sherrington. Today we're going to be reflecting on our interview with Jethro Jones and everything he had to say about his work over in the US. And then we're going to be talking about some very interesting topics. Tom assures me that he's got lots to say about broccoli and leadership, which I'm very interested to hear about. Then we're going to kind of unpick the latest headlines in the UK about the cancellation of some of our um, statutory exams. And then we're going to dip into some of the latest releases from John Cat that are linked to Tom's work, Tom and Ollie's work with their walkthroughs. So in terms of our uh, interview with Jethro, I absolutely love talking to him. What an amazing bloke, not just because of the Steve story, Tom, where he talked about everybody called Steve in the school, um, but he told us so much about how to identify and act on issues that you find in your school as a leader. So what did you take from the interview that we did with him, uh, Tom? I took away lots of things. I mean, yeah, I mean, the Steve story, which was fantastic, where, you know, he, he talked about somebody who, who called everybody in his school Steve because he was, there were too many students to remember their names. So he just said, hi, Steve, how's it going, Steve? And it just made everyone feel like they belonged. And to be honest with you, I mean, that is, it's one of the things that sometimes I, I think about my times ahead. And I've got this image of talking to a group of four girls and this girl said to me you don't know my name do you sir <laughs> and it was so awkward because I really didn't and I knew the other three but she kind of knew that I didn't know her name and I felt really sad I, and I it was like there was no way out of it and it was just a terrible moment but if I'd been able to say oh come on Steve or something to sort of diffuse the situation or kind of like I knew I knew about her to be honest I because I knew you, sometimes you know about students that you know a bit about them but I didn't know her name and that was for her painful so anyway, I didn't teach her and I did teach the other three. So, but that was funny. But I, so he had full of, he was full of those stories. I'll tell you the thing I, I was also impressed with. This is in terms of us doing this podcast. Jethro has done 350 episodes. <laughs> That's insane, isn't it? So oh he's my been reaching out to other teachers through his podcast for seven years on a weekly basis. I think that's inspirational. Well, you can tell that from his book as well, because I, I think I said in the interview that rarely do you read something that's so rich in terms of anecdotes and references to other educators. And it was, it's an absolute delight to read because there's just so many, there's, there's his sort of continuous narrative throughout the book, but then there's so many other voices that you can hear echoing all the way through it. It's absolutely, absolutely fascinating to read that book and so many different perspectives that he manages to pull together in one continuous narrative which I absolutely thought was was brilliant about his book but I love the idea that he, that he has about how he addresses problems at both student level and teacher level and then community level he really puts his schools at the heart of the communities that they yeah. serve which I thought was brilliant and not just for the canned food drive either <laughs> Yeah, that, so that was a good one, wasn't it? So this thing, that, and that, that to me was a, well, a classic example of where, you know, sometimes people talk about leadership in quite grandiose language, let's be honest, and, and it can seem a bit a removed from like the nitty gritty, but he's totally the opposite of that. So he's, he, he had a couple of examples, one of which was this challenge in a middle school he worked in where um, the, the focus had sort of become on students being rewarded for how well they supported this canned food drive, a kind of charity community event to the point where they're almost being graded <laughs> on how, how many cans of food they were able to collect or whatever, um, rather than the academic achievement. And he felt this was a bit of a conflict because their stated aims were about academic achievement. But de facto, students were more motivated by their support for the canned food drive. And he was trying to kind of resolve that tension. I, I thought that was a really good example. Have you ever come across anything like that? Um, it's, yeah, it's interesting about the, how much he writes and speaks about a school's identity and how that particular school's identity become, became raveled up in the canned food drive, which I'm guessing is a little bit like the Harvest Festival that we might have over here. Um, but it, I really enjoyed listening to him talking about making sure that you understand when you're a leader what your school actually stands for and what and how it's different from maybe the school down the road you know what do you actually stand for and being really really clear about this is what we do here this is what we stand for this is what we don't do here and i loved his work that he's done on analyzing schools kind of mission statements and value statements and mm. it was it's 
quite kind of tongue in cheek when you read his book when he gradually unravels these like say these grandiose statements and says they don't mean anything. <laughs> <laughs> But I think I, I think one of the challenges leaders have, and I've I've certainly had this experience in the past, where you're trying to project something to sort of the outside world to, to sort of say, hey, come and come to us. We're a great school. We're on the way up. You have to put a you have to put a sort of positive message because you know no one wants to sign up to a school which everyone is saying it's a bit rubbish. You know, you say you say this is we're going, but actually, if you know deep down there's imperfections that you're sort of trying to sort out in the background. You, you, it is a, a, a balancing act. So you sort of put this sort of positive message forward, but you're hoping that the reality uh, meets the, the, the rhetoric. Um, and sometimes it doesn't. And, you know, he was, he was really good on that. The other, the other really detailed thing he talked about was this thing, his design um, uh, concept. And that's what the key theme of the book really is, that is to develop skills through with, he, he sort of talked about the difference between leadership and design and, leadership being more sort of design being more kind of intentional and strategic and he talked about prototyping which is quite interesting and then the example he gave was about how to how to streamline the the lunch queue and I thought I love the, the how prosaic that is like we're really not being the sort of too grand are we when we talk about how to how to streamline the, the lunch queue yeah but Tom when you're a school leader if lunchtime's gone badly that's every afternoon absolutely yeah. ruined so it's the it's the focus on what might outwardly seem unimportant that actually has a huge impact so so sorting out lunchtime sorting out behavior at lunchtime and oiling the wheels of the afternoon kind of mentality of everybody and the mood that they come in in is is really important and I, I just love the way that he attacks every and unpicks every aspect of the school day for for every user be that the user who's the parent the child the teacher i i really like the fact that he he looks at things from everybody's perspective not just kind of the teaching and learning what goes on in the classroom but actually what goes on in our school community i really enjoyed hearing about that from him yeah me too and i think people will will uh, will like listening to him he's sort of super down to earth and um got a lot 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 to say and he reminded me of i don't know there's so, so many sort of nitty-gritty conversations as you're right it's sort of a, a nice to puncture the <laughs> the great intellectual thinking around you know teaching and learning and curriculum design you think you no know, lunch queue that yeah. kind of stuff the can drive anyway so i, I thought it was interesting to, to talk to him and hopefully people will, will pick up that episode um which is the one uh before this one uh, in in our, our podcast now lunchtime brings us neatly on Tom to what you might have for your lunch <laughs> as in broccoli because just before we came on air you said I want to talk about broccoli fractals and I thought I was hearing something or I was slightly more sleep deprived than I normally am um, because of my children and so you're going to enlighten us about your leadership thinking linked to broccoli fractals so I'm just going to sit back for a minute and let you let you unleash the broccoli Tom <laughs> Okay, well, I, I, I tell you why I was thinking about this. It's because I, I realised, as we were talking to Jethro, and he had this design uh, concept about leadership, um, it reminded me of our conversation with Robin when, when she was on, and she talked about builders, and her, her whole thing is about build, 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 and, and teachers and leaders being builders, you know. Cause, and, I, and I like that, because basically what she's saying is, you know, you've got to have people who are trying to, you can't mandate everything that happens in the school, but what you need is people who are prepared to, to create the thing that you want it to be. And you can't do that by yourself. So you have to create a team of builders who are with you on the journey. And that means that some people who aren't necessarily on side straight away, you know, you kind of can't worry too much about them, but what you need is your kind of vanguard of builders. So there is, these are these different uh, leadership sort of metaphors going on. And it, I was thinking that one of my favorite ones, um, was when I, I heard on a, on a, on a training course um, presented by a guy called Dave Harris, who was the head teacher, and he, he, he was on Twitter at Bravehead. That's his, his uh, handle. And he, he told us about the, the, uh, a business writer called Margaret Wheatley and um, the idea of organisational effectiveness being about designing the repeatable unit that you then sort of amplify all the way uh, around around the school or the in institution so there's a kind of um if you look at this up if you're, anyone listening to this wants to google uh, romanesco bro broccoli it's a kind of broccoli where you've got these sort of spirals and they've got the little pyramids 
and they're absolutely beautiful. So each each little pyramid is tiny, but when you when you look at the whole broccoli, it's just a sort of it's like a pyramid of pyramids of pyramids, and each little bit is repeat reproduced sort of from from the sort of re, the unit, and it's it's gorgeous. So you get spirals within spirals within spirals, and the actual original kind of defining unit is is actually quite specific. It's like this sort of tiny little pyramid, and it's the way it's so what what he was saying is so in a school you can't control every interaction with students and kids you can't control every lesson you can't you can't control every time the receptionist meets a new a visitor but what you can do is define the kind of unit that's reproduced the kind of ethos the the things which we care about which matter which then if you get those right, if you're really clear about the way we do things at a kind of a very sort of clean and clear level, then people get the principles that are applied to those situations. And then they're going to, you'll get the sort of reproducing thing going on. So because this is how we do things here, this is how I'm going to talk to you in the lesson. And because this is how we do things here, this is how I'm going to meet you at the door when you come as a parent or, and all those sorts of things. And I thought that was interesting. So that, that, that to me is, it's a really interesting concept, this idea of working hard to, to really think what what are that what is that reproducible element like a fractal which kind of we see at different scales at a whole school scale and down to a kind of micro interaction between a teacher and a student scale and can, can you make a link between them like the spirit the ethos you know and it could be to do with things like academic rigor and a kind of quite a pushy kind of intensity or it could be a kind of caring sharing kind of vibe or i mean there are quite specific differences in certain schools anyway that's that's what it's about that's that's where the broccoli fractals comes in <laughs> what do you think of that I love it. and it leads to what jethro was saying as well about having that kind of strap line or that motto or whatever you want to call it that actually means something because that's exactly what he was saying as well about that you need to have something which translates into every area of the school every interaction every conversation every enactment of whatever it is they're doing with that teaching or learning or talking to a parent or um you know out on a school visit somewhere when we used to be allowed to leave the building and go to places <laughs> um but yeah it's I think establishing that as a leader and communicating that in a leader as a leader sounds like a really straightforward thing to do. You know, this is this is what we do. This is what we stand for. But actually, then translating it into those little broccoli fractals of actually go, you know, this is what we stand for. But how would it look for every member of staff and the way that they work? How would it look for every department? How would it look for every child? How would it look for every subject? It's a really interesting concept to think about, kind of replication and duplication. Mm. But different scenarios i really i really like that tom thank you what, what, what's quite interesting and i've got a quote here because i'm, I'm reading this out but because i wrote it down on, on a, an old blog i wrote it's about six years ago but it this is this is what she said so she says in true it, in true fractal fashion agreements do not restrict individuals from embodying them in diverse and unique ways so self-similarity is achieved not through compliance to an exhausting set of standards and rules but from a few simple principles that everyone is accountable for operating in a condition of individual freedom so that's the that's the point so when you're in your classroom you've got a lot of autonomy a lot of freedom and as long as you honor the principles you can kind of do things your way so it's also a recipe for people kind of feeling a little bit liberated provided that the key kind of ideas are honored and that that's that's quite i i find motivating you know you don't you don't want to feel like there are 57 rules that i mustn't bend from and that applies to teachers, teaching. Oh. It just occurred to me when you were talking then, it's a bit like being in a family. Like, <laughs> as a family, you live in a household. You all kind of know how you work in that household. You all kind of know what you stand for, what you're about, what your morals are. But you all behave slightly differently, <laughs> have different interests and a different focus. I mean, I'd like to think I'd behave slightly differently from my four-year-old. But he's very clear about what's important to us as a family and what, you know, what we stand for, what we don't stand for. Maybe I've oversimplified it. <laughs> yeah, no, a good example, defo, defo. Thank you. Which kind of thinking about good examples and good answers brings us on to the thorny subject of exams again. Because as we were talking um, before we came on air, um, the announcement about the cancellation of exams um, in parts uh, in parts of the UK came out. So we have now got a somewhat fractured system. 
uh, for accountability this, ac this academic year because different children or different students in different parts of the UK are going to be having a very different experience at the end of their phases and stages. So what are your thoughts on that, Tom? Yeah, I mean, I think it's fair to say that it's a changing thing. And um, in Wales, even, I mean, there, there are some assessments, it's just they're at different times and there won't be standardised teachers will be setting them. But in England, um, yeah, we, we, you know, the, the detail of what's going to happen isn't there and it could still be that exams are going to happen. Mm. My, my feeling is this, if I was teaching an exam class now, I'd want them to have something really solid to aim at because it's really, really hard to teach without that you, you, there's that kind of and partly it's because we're kind of all um ru sort of <laughs> we've got the routines around that that's kind of how it's always been and it's hard to just sort of flip that over and say right we don't do that anymore until we create a new type of intensity but it's also the i i just really really believe that students like it's like getting ready for a show you know a performance when you when you whenever, whenever you've been in a rehearsal and, and done the show there's something about the need to perform on the day which really brings out everyone everyone the the the, the incredible intensity pushes you to a level that you would never reach otherwise you know if you didn't have that need to be ready for the show if you wouldn't you wouldn't rehearse as hard you wouldn't fight as hard over that to overcome things and I think that that doesn't that's not how school should be all the time. But I think there's real value in kids experiencing that. And I so I, I think without that, I think you pull the rug under and you've got this sort of slightly nebulous soft endpoint, which will not just affect the kids in terms of their qualifications that they receive and the grading aspect. It's actually the, the depth of learning is going to suffer because they won't be pushed as far and hard as they could have been. I, I, I generally think that. Um, and so and that's, that's part of my experience with it. What do you, what, what, I mean, what's your sense of it? Wrangling with it, I'm just wrangling with, with it a little bit, because I'm, when you're talking about being pushed as far, I'm thinking being pushed as far as they can to meet the criteria in that particular type of assessment, rather than, um, rather than kind of, I don't mean studying for studying's sake or discovering the joy of learning and carrying you know, lifelong learning and all this business. But I'm just thinking if we were genuinely talking about depth and breadth of study and if we were genuinely wanting children to really excel in a particular subject, is just an examination the best way to test that depth and breadth and to motivate them? I'm just playing devil's advocate here. Not just an exam, but it's got to matter. So... And, and for me, it's not about the the some. It's not the debate just about the kind of the issue around the value the value of exams and qualifications. Oh, no, no, no. It, it's to do with the actual learning. Mm. I really think that. So, for example, I mean, I I can remember it from myself, and I I've had this discussion with lots of other people. I saw it with my own children. I, I can remember kind of getting uh, chemistry, kind of, and needing to pass the exam, and just really getting into it. Uh, opening the textbook and really studying it and, and just really pushing myself to sort of think oh yeah 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 okay that all makes sense now because I had to and my daughter had exactly the same and we, we, we until when she did her GCSE chemistry she suddenly was like oh my god chemistry is really cool <laughs> she hates she like this is so interesting she chose it to do it for a level after the GCSE experience was so rewarding to her because because she really needed to get into it finally it suddenly all clicked to place. And I saw that with my son over English literature, for example. He had to study these poems. And you think people always go on about exams kill the love of poetry. Well, it didn't for him. It like, totally turned him on to the rigour and the, the study aspect of it. So actually, I've seen it happen so often in my own family. I just think, gosh, what? Without that, it's all just, it, there's, the, yeah, there's just, nothing like it. I just think of it, when to go along with your performance analogy, is I remember what, as a, as a young child learning the piano. And I remember that you had to learn set pieces for your examinations. And like you say, it was nerve wracking and you, and you would practice those pieces and you would practice those pieces and practice and practice until you could play them almost blindfold. And you would go in and you would perform them and you would get assessed uh, to see what grade you were for that particular exam. 
that didn't necessarily mean I had a deep and really thorough understanding of of music or even the even the particular composer I'd learn or the the type of piece that I'd learn it meant I'd learned some stuff that I could replicate for an exam mm. and that's what that's where that's where the argument that the exam provides the rigor and the depth and the breadth kind of falls apart for me because I think yes you can learn some stuff to get you through a specific specific syllabus and a specific test but actually does that really promote deep learning within that particular subject? It might ignite learning. It might, like you said, your daughter said chemistry is really cool. It might, might turn them onto that. But for a lot of children, it will be kind of jumping through hoops to, you know, jumping through the narrowest of hoops to prove something rather than a real deep, genuine understanding of a subject. And that's kind of, that's where the use no, of... That's where the use of a high stakes test in a small aspect of a subject. I know it's part of assessment. I know it's part of a broader picture of assessment. But actually that being the ultimate test of how much you've learned in that subject, it doesn't just... Doesn't well, I, get, I get the argument about the different forms of assessment. So, for example, uh, you know, uh, you, we, you could debate whether you have to have exams where you sort of answer questions and have to do them in time conditions versus, say, producing... And essays over a period of time or some more extended things or practical assessments even oral you know vivas and interviews that kind of thing there's so many different debates around that but I still feel that without the without it sort of needing to really count um, and you do need to have an aspect of it mattering and stepping up and delivering and that's the kind of intensity I think is is at risk in this current situation because where schools will schools will find it hard to recreate that because people will just think well what happened last year was wherever the teacher thought of me they kind of judged me with the best possible intentions and they'll they'll kind of it will soften that intensity and the students won't think as hard i just don't think it's as easy to say exams sort of are opposite to deeper uh, learning because my experience teaching in lots of different <laughs> Secondary school is that exams a sort of drive really deep learning actually quite often and um, of course there might be some surface aspects to that but I think those are sort of mitigated by the depth you get through the the real drive and I, I you know I, I there's something about that intensity which I think is quite quite exciting actually love <laughs> that's right on yeah, yeah. One thing I will say, though, that's, a, that's an interesting observation from my, from my own practice and talking to other people who were teaching at the time, um, was when we used to have Key Stage 2 science sats, then there used to be this sort of... That's, it, that's the end of elementary school, that's that, that for people to... Yeah, we used to have an end of, end of um, Key Stage 2 set of examinations. So when the children were 11, before they moved up to the high school, they would be assessed in English, maths and, and science. Um, and they had tests in English, maths and science. And then in a particular year, um, the government decided to scrap the science tests. And all of a sudden, the curriculum that was taught in many schools went from being very science rich to there wasn't quite as much science as there used to be mm. and a lot of secondary teachers would report that actually it wasn't necessarily standards were going down it wasn't necessarily the children were less capable but actually the depth of knowledge and skill that they were coming up with there was definitely a change in what they were what they were seeing and i know from my own practice as well i mean i'm a science I'm a science trained teacher, so obviously I, I still kind of kept the, the science wheel turning. But even in your own head, when you're thinking, there's not, that, there's not that test at the end, there is an element of, it reduces the urgency. I um, agree. And also, if it was a teaching, so when, when, when we used to have those assessments in, so for, for anyone listening outside the UK, so that would have been, what, grade? Sixth grade sixth grade no fifth grade we, we the exams then so kids students are 11 and they were they, some of the exams were questions in science were things like um now here's the, here's the sun going across the sky how would it look um in in the summer draw draw the trajectory if it was the autumn and and and, and that to me was a really great question like your students need to know that it's lower in the sky and they have to explain why and that was it 
And those sorts of questions, I meet teachers now who don't even know the answer, <laughs> you know. And it, it's in one of your books, isn't it? Need to know it. <laughs> when, when, you, when you have an assessment, which is a nationally standard exam, standardised exam, or it doesn't have to be national, but it has to be sort of externally uh, set with a kind of standard attached to it. You look at those assessments and think, okay, we've got to at least meet that standard. And of course, there's a risk of just teaching to the test, like just focusing on that at the expense of all else. Of course there is. But there's also a rigor in everyone knowing the sorts of basic knowledge your children are supposed to have. And now I feel some of them don't. And I feel like there will be students who, without the exam to aim at, will end up with a slightly flabbier, <laughs> looser set of knowledge than they would otherwise have had. So that's my positive spin in it. And I, I put my hand up and say, I'm about as pro exam as you can be, even though I think I'm quite a rounded person. Uh, <laughs> I, I recognize there are different perspectives, you know, it is an interesting debate to have, isn't it? I see, I, I'm kind of on the fence with, with exams. I can see the value of them. I totally get them. I, I totally get the need for standardization and for rigor and what have you, but there is nothing more soul destroying than knowing that a kid in your class has started writing on a writing paper, completely got the wrong end of the stick and is just not going to achieve what they what you thought they were going to and there's nothing you can do about it <laughs> that, 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 that high stakes accountability is there's something that needs addressing there but that's potentially for another day <laughs>
and so Kate Jones, who a lot of people know from her work on retrieval practice and, and so on, is writing that. So that's the next three. And there are some more. We've got some other like Sonia Thompson, who's been on our program. She, uh, she is uh, writing a book uh, about Ron Berger's Ethic of Excellence. Um, a couple of other people who are coming up as well. So there's, there's about eight already lined up. And it's proving quite popular. People like the idea of teachers taking research ideas and talking about how they actually work. And I think it's a good, a good sort of recipe for making sense of things. They're really easy to access as well. They're so readable. And it, like you say, the, there's so much credibility in them as well, because these are people referencing exactly what they're doing in their classrooms every day. And, you know, this works. This, this research actually works when you do this. So I think the inaction aspect of them is, is so important. And I cannot believe, well, I can actually, but the kind of the endorsements that you've got from the original writers of the research papers as well. How powerful is that? So you've got that whole circle of the research paper, the series, the class teacher, the, the whole book. I remember speaking to Nimish in the summer about something else and he kind of let slip. He was writing it. And I was so excited. How I kept a lid on that, I do not know. <laughs> yeah, yes. I mean, he, you know, I, I, all of them, I, I asked them all to do it and then they they were all quite keen to contact the the, the 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 original author where they could and so far I mean people have been very upbeat about it so Art Shimamura who's he was really chuffed to be asked <laughs> so he was he's and Nimish has had in, been in touch with him and Ron Berger uh, working with uh, Sonia Thompson for example that's been great so uh, and with John Thompson uh, Collins uh, Mr I don't know Professor Collins has been giving him really detailed feedback on on his chapters <laughs> quite quite you know direct you know he's sort of saying you know I'm not about sure about this sort of thing it's good it, it, so it gives you that rigor but I, I, I think it's uh, hopefully you know it, people people um, will value each book and as a series once there's a whole stack of them I quite like the idea of them being like the sort of ladybird books you know where you, you line them all up along the spine you've got a whole set um, and all I do I mean literally all I do is I ask the people to do it and then when they finish they send it to me and I say well done but I, that's pretty much it so it, I feel like I'm just a kind of um you know the organizer but um it, that I it, that's been a real joy for me to do it they are really great and they unpick so many of the the concepts and the approaches and the research that people may have heard a little bit about or read a little bit about but translating it into that actual this is what it looks like in the classroom it it really brings the whole thing to life and it kind of makes it jump from the research paper into that enactment in the classroom which is and because they're so small as well they're not necessarily really difficult to navigate really weighty you know that you don't have to it you know bookmark three weeks of your holiday to actually get through them mm. they're they're really useful i read the generative learning in, in action one whilst my children were at swimming lessons the other time. <laughs> sat on the side with my face mask on reading generative learning in action while they learnt the butterfly so, uh, I mean for me when I first picked it up when I first about heard the generative from Marge actually the, the G of Marge that Shimamura wrote right that's the first time I really clocked it and then I, I thought oh it's the same thing as the Fiorella and Mayer so they I love the fact that these things overlap mm. and to me that idea that students need to be generative and thinking and it, it's so it's such a great concept. I mean, it's something which I've probably known about indirectly for, for decades, but um, I hadn't really uh, clocked it as, as a thing um, until very recently. So it just shows even, even though you can be teaching for a long time, ideas come around. In fact, you know, just as a bit of an aside, but I had an email a couple of days ago from a student that I taught uh, in 1989. Uh, and I took her to Oxford University on an open day. Um, in that, and she got a place which I didn't know actually um and she she wrote to me saying she just heard of her, she just picked up that I was on Twitter and stuff and uh she said do you remember me we went to this Oxford field trip and um with a, and and I did I totally remembered her name and everything it's like it's so so wild isn't it but it's like she's like 50 now and I'm 55 but that's how that's how life goes it's great teaching you know it, it you you have this influence on on people years later and that's that's quite good but you don't always understand what you're doing <laughs> I've got a skit student at the moment who I taught when he was year three, <laughs> which is a very strange situation. <laughs> that is a bit strange, yeah, that is a bit strange. Funny. Well, look, thank you very much for reading those books. And I hope, hopefully, you know, there are video um, 
uh, YouTube interviews with the authors, which are good to see. You can find them on my blog or on YouTube. And we'll, so I love that. You, you, you can access all these people and they talk about their work. And I think that's really great. And um, we're about to interview um, Pratice Bain. So in the next episode after this one, you'll see us interviewing Pratice Bain and her excellent work on retrieval practice, powerful teaching and more. So thank you very much for joining us um on the podcast and on on our youtube and we hope to see you again very soon thank you very much from me and emma <laughs> <laughs>